Hello everyone and welcome to uh, well, oh, July. July's uh, NHSR Communities webinar and we're pleased to be joined by uh, Jane who also works um, on the NHSR Community Project and also um, Alex Lawless from the Strategy Unit who will be um, sharing his work on hip replacements with us today. Uh, before we begin, I just wanted to share some uh, information that we always share about um, what the NHSR community can offer you. Um, please do remember to regularly check our website nhsrcommunity.com and um, also our YouTube page where this recording will be posted shortly after the webinar. We also have our very active um, Slack channel and also the Twitter page, so if you think of any questions after the webinar today, um, feel free to join Slack um, and a member will be more than happy to help you. And we also have our featured partner, HexiTime, which we encourage all our members to join. HexiTime is a free platform where you can exchange skills and ideas for health and care improvement. We have many members from the community um, on there. Um, so if you think of a project or need, in need of some help, Hexi Time is a great place to find someone to um, help you out. Before um, I hand over to Alex, we just wanted to share a Menti with you today. Um, so if you could go to menti.com. And enter the code 31074022. I'll pop that in the Q&A box here. Is. We have a couple of questions just to find out a bit more about who is joining us today. Just give everyone a second to to join there. I'm sure there'll be some crossover there of people who've been using it for less than a year, but it also feels like forever. That is very true, Alex. <laughs> It looks like we have um, a real mix between some new users and some people that have been using it for a, for a while longer. And that matches those some beginners and some people who are a bit more confident with, uh, with R, which is what we'd expect for, for our community. And there we go, Alex. So again, people will kind of know a bit about our markdown, but perhaps then um, not super confident. Yeah. But Alex, are you um, happy for me to hand over to, to you now? Ready to yeah, go? yeah, I think so. Yeah, thank you. That was kind of useful for me to kind of gauge oh, where it was. That seems like they're quite similar to me, really, like somewhere in the middle. Mm -hmm. So I'll just start sharing now, shall I? Yeah, do feel free to start sharing. And just so everyone knows, um, if you haven't attended a, an HSR webinar before, in the top of your screen, there should be um, two little speech bubbles with a question mark. That's the Q&A function. So if you have any questions for Alex throughout, you can post them there um, and Alex um, will either answer as he goes along or we'll come back to the Q&A at the end. Uh, yeah, I suppose give me a give me a little shout there, Beth, if something pops up because I can't see that anymore now. No problem. So, um, so yeah, so as Beth mentioned, uh, my name's Alex. I am a, a healthcare analyst with a strategy unit. Um, I kind of wanted to get a, get a feel of where everyone was at really with R. Um, because I think in the past, the webinars have been kind of taken by lots of people who are quite advanced R users and, you know, with great value that they can kind of pass on that various expertise. Um, whereas I'm much more um, kind of, you know, novice to intermediate kind of level user really. I've, 
I'm a nurse by trade, but kind of started moving into the kind of analytical side um, a couple of years ago. So I hadn't kind of heard of R at all until before then. Um, so I'm kind of definitely somewhere in the middle there. So hopefully this will be somewhat accessible to, to all of those who, who said they were around that point as well. So this project, um, we, we kind of got directly from the Health Foundation. So they came to us asking for some kind of insights around the changing um, rates of HIP activity throughout the pandemic and throughout the kind of recovery um, to contribute to one of their kind of online long reads. So kind of headline finding really um, is that there was obviously a kind of a COVID induced deficit where COVID had a, a kind of impact on elective care and therefore created a, a buildup of HIP replacements that weren't able to be undertaken. Um, also, I've just mentioned one just figure from remembered. I'll um, I'm basically going to kind of approach this, but in, in kind of two two strands. I'm going to kind of go through the results of the the work, but then also kind of reflect on the process of doing this, kind of primarily in in kind of R and our, our markdown, and how that then affected our kind of interactions with with our clients, and and how that was able to be kind of steered and stuff collaboratively. So. The, the kind of hypothesis, I suppose, coming in uh, is that you'd expect a, a change in elective care to um, to have some effect or some kind of manifestation in unplanned emergency care. So the, the kind of the, the overriding question really was: Did we did we see changes in elective care, and therefore were there subsequent increases in um, in unplanned related injuries like hip like falls and kind of broken neck of femurs, open wounds, hip. Um, dislocations and that kind of stuff. So the question is, so that was going to question then I'll kind of go through where, whether we, we feel we like we answered that or not. In terms of the data, um, all the data was sourced from um, NCDR. So we used kind of SUS, you know, secondary user service data um, accessed via NCDR. So for anyone who doesn't have access or kind of hasn't heard of NCDR, which encourage you to give that a Google. Um, it stands for the, I think, National Commissioning Repository Data. So it's a kind of a, a, a huge kind of source of um, healthcare data with um, national coverage that if you kind of qualify for access to, it can be really, really valuable. So we wanted to look at inpatient care, outpatient and also emergency care. Uh, in terms of inpatient care, we, we kind of split, uh, split that up by looking at procedure codes, um, primarily for the primary or, or, or revisions to hip replacements. Um, we also wanted to identify any outpatient appointments associated with those with those inpatient procedures. So pre-op um, kind of admission or pre-op assessments and post-op kind of reviews. So that was kind of that was looked at by using the um, diagnosis codes of these outpatient appointments. And finally, we wanted to also look at any emergency department attendances, um, and that was primarily used, looked at by identifying SNOMED CT codes for um, anything related to, to these diagnoses here. So as I said, fractured hips, falls, sprains, dislocations, and, and kind of open wounds. Anything that would suggest uh, an acute complication to, to a hip procedure, whether that's kind of pre or post-op. So in terms of the analysis plan, main questions were for us to answer were how how did the, the kind of patients who were treated for for hip replacements how did the, the cohort of how did the characteristics of that cohort change throughout the various um, stages of the pandemic so at the kind of height of um, the kind of health the healthcare stress who was prioritized and inversely who were who was kind of proposed uh, postponed did those did that appear to be a clinically driven decision is it that elderly people or people who are most kind of clinically needy were prioritized or was it more a case of varying access um similarly what were the characteristics of the cohort of people who had uh, rises in, in ed attendances um, and then we wanted to look at these things broken down by care setting disease type demographics and, and geography there's also a bit of a a um application to quality of life as well at the end there, which I'll which I'll kind of quickly cover. So at a high level, the first thing to do was just to plot changes in inpatient care or in inpatient admissions. So for this, I used a package called I think DY graph, um, which is essentially like an interactive time series where you feed in um, just a like a date field and a number of admissions field, which gives us this pretty output. 
So this is just a, a kind of a tool for, for readers to be able to kind of explore the data themselves in quite a, an interactive and obviously very visual way. So we see fairly consistent pre-pandemic levels. We see um, you know, seasonal drop-offs in terms of elective care attendances uh, you know, around, around Christmas and New Year. And then obviously along comes COVID and we see a kind of a huge drop off, a gradual recovery, obviously not to the a recovery, not to the, the kind of pre-pandemic levels. And then, a, you know, a subsequent drop off with, with second or third or fourth waves, depending on how you define them. So just a feature of these graphs, which are quite, quite nifty, I suppose, um, is that you can, you can highlight the periods you want to look at and you can kind of drill down a little bit. So this can be done using this toolbar below as well. So we want, if we want to, you know, particularly focus on the the, the drop off and then also the recovery, we can do that. We can zoom out again, and we can also identify particular days where there were higher attendances than others, or higher by kind of, I suppose, um, yeah, manipulating the this axis here. But yeah, so kind of the context there. In terms of um, activity by care setting, we see varying levels of, of disruption in different settings as you would expect. So in terms of planned inpatient care, we see huge drop offs similarly with outpatient where you know where flow can be controlled, less so with emergency care, but obviously still a, a kind of reduction in terms of um, either care seeking behavior or disease or kind of you know, injury rates or injury stimulus. And that was just done, that's just a just a normal GG plot and a facet wrap by the activity. I'll just skip to deprivation. So for each of these, throughout this kind of piece of work, I looked at everything by kind of age, deprivation and ethnicity, but for the for this presentation, I'll just focus on deprivation for the, in the interest of time. So to answer the question of how, how did we um, identify varying um, cohort characteristics. We started off by just mapping the, the kind of competing proportions of, of those patients who were receiving um, hip replacements by, in this case, deprivation. So this is an example of a, a ggplot kind of flat graph being inputted to the ggplotly function, which is generates interactive um, graphs. So again, a kind of a tool for the reader to, to explore the data themselves, where we can obviously plot these I think it was a geom, these geom smooth lines and, and also the geom points and the kind of reader can identify them how they want. So in terms of the results that jump out to us from this graph, we, we do see a, at the height of the of kind of the, I suppose the very, very early stage of the pandemic where you might say the, the stress was the highest. We do see a, a bit of a proportional increase in people receiving hip replacements from the least deprived 20%. So the, the most affluent 20% of the, of the country saw a, an increase in, in kind of representation in, in those patients receiving uh, emergency care, also elective care that is. Similarly, and kind of interestingly, we see a, a rise as well in the proportional representation of um, patients receiving elective care in the lowest levels of affluence, the, the most deprived 20%. And so perhaps a bit of a, a squeezing in the middle. But again, just a bit of a tool for, for people to explore the data there themselves. You can highlight where you want to look at and zoom in that way. I'll see have these kind of pop up information based on what you want to tell the tell the reader. So that was ggplot. Another way of doing something similar is to use this stream graph function. Where we input the same data, the proportional um, or the proportion of people receiving uh, emergency, sorry, receiving hip replacements from different deprivation quintiles, or quintiles, yeah, which looks a little bit like this. So it's just plot along the kind of the year, and we can see again in quite an interactive and kind of you know, pretty way how those proportions changed. However, you may all be thinking that you know this is somewhat limited in that this period here where we're most interested in the kind of height of the stress who was prioritised. We we obviously can't really tell because the, the frequency of those admissions got so much smaller relative to the pre-pandemic rates that the, you're not able to identify that. So although pretty, the stream graph tool was, was swiftly moved to one side for the rest of this piece of work. 
and we settled on, I'll come back to this code in a second, we settled on this configuration of, of graphs to, to try and display the change in proportions of people receiving care. So this is just obviously a stacked bar chart with, again, the deprivation quintiles. So we can see fairly consistent pre-pandemic levels in terms of in terms of representation by deprivation. And we see a fairly aggressive change up in proportion at the start of the pandemic, but then a quite a quick return to something mirroring um, pre-pandemic levels. And again, you can kind of highlight particular groups that you want to identify. And I think you can also, yeah, you can also just click and drag and zoom in on certain proportions. So to do that, this is um, a combination of two GG plot, plot graphs. So, oh, sorry, GG plot lead graphs. So two interactive graphs where we have the kind of the overall time series in terms of admission counts, uh, weekly admission counts and others, alongside the proportions. So to do that, we use something called a uh, subplot package, where the kind of the input is two different GG plotly interactive graphs. So Graph one starts and ends here, and then graph graph two starts and ends here, I think. And then we just state to the subplot function how we want those graphs to be presented alongside each other. So in this case, I want I didn't didn't want kind of 50-50. I wanted the top graph to have the majority of the space and the bottom graph to be a bit of a reference for the reader. So in this which case we use the heights. Uh, argument and, and state 80 20 and then add titles and stuff. So we got to this point where we found a, a kind of a satisfying I suppose way to present this information but then I suppose realized that deriving any any um, findings from from these results are limited I suppose in that while we're interested in this period here um, looking at proportions of patients by certain groups in this piece, this period here is somewhat invalid in that the numbers are so incredibly low. So, so the drop off of admissions went to, to near zero for a good number of weeks. So identifying any patterns here would be not statistically sound essentially. Um, so, so, so in that case, we then move from this kind of methodology to looking at um, deficits in the whole recovery period, as opposed to just the kind of the height of the lockdown. Is there any questions on that so far? Any comments? I'm kind of happy to to kind of give and take, I suppose, in that sense. Nothing popping up. No. So in terms of um, looking at the deficit in plans admissions, this is somewhat similar in kind of methodolo methodology to um, outputs you might have seen on excess deaths, where a, a kind of a, a trend of interest, you know, the most recent trend, i.e. in this case 2020, is compared to a, a previous um, level of activity that we might, might expect, and they're kind of the difference between those two things are is defined as either the, the deficit or the excess number of, of whatever. So in this case, we plotted the average um, kind of admission rates per week for 2018, 2019, and also plotted those alongside the admission rates for 2020. So the gap between those two curves can be, can be defined as the deficit. So it's kind of what we're seeing compared to what we would expect to see. So, this is all about the kind of the area under under the curve in that sense. So that can be kind of visualized in this way as well. So we can just plot the admission deficit. So as the difference between those two lines increases, the admission deficit increases. As the difference between those two lines decreases, the admission deficit then decreases. So overall, we see that around 57,000 admissions were were lost or were disrupted or delayed or however you want to describe them, they didn't didn't occur where we would expect them to occur. That's kind of in, in England over 2020 between this point in the pandemic and the end of the year. So kind of COVID induced deficit, we can say. So this is the difference between the lines pre national lockdown aren't, aren't considered in that number. So that's just 
yeah, that's just a kind of the patchwork um, function where you just call library patchwork and you can add two two graph objects together. And again, you can kind of define whether they're split horizontally or vertically or what proportions they're they're kind of given. In that case, it's just 50-50, one alongside the other. So that's the national picture. If we break that down by look, uh, looking at the regional level, um, which again is just done by a, um, a facet wrap type function on the on the region, we we see a few things here, I suppose. So the first point to note is that pre-pandemic levels were were quite varied. Obviously, with the Midlands and Northeast Yorkshire, we're seeing much higher levels of pre-pandemic uh, kind of treatment in terms of um, for replacements probably just a function of their kind of patient catchment area and patient size and perhaps demographics. Um, but we'll come on to look at kind of relative changes. So at the moment we're seeing different pre-pandemic levels. We're seeing a fairly uniform kind of drop to near zero in all areas where, where that was obviously a result of kind of national policy. Um, so that was kind of a, an equalizing effect, I suppose, in that all, all, all regions experience near zero. And then we're seeing kind of different recovery shapes. We're seeing the Midlands, for example, is dropping to near zero, but then then recovery is kind of is starting almost immediately, gradually at first, and then and then kind of more steeply. Whereas most of the regions have a, a prolonged near zero period, where they're near zero um, for for the whole of the first recovery, for the first lockdown period, and then starting towards the end of that or, or into the recovery period. And just finally. London is the only area um, that actually achieved a, their recovery. I suppose they've completed their recovery, you might say, that they, they achieved their pre-pandemic levels, you know, nearly in the southeast, but generally the recoveries didn't achieve pre-pandemic levels because of you know second waves and, and numerous kind of other impacts. But that's kind of worth remembering is that London had a different recovery shape, and that's mostly I think down to uh, taking a different approach to, to recovery and that London adopted a bit of a, a bit of a specialist hub-like approach where they funneled uh, surgery, surgery, federal care by a special speciality to different sites, which seemingly was a kind of more effective and perhaps a bit more of an, a resilient uh, recovery approach. And then there's also differences in funding as well, so it's it's a different difficult thing to to define exactly. So here I've also included um, an example of a way we, we can import the online data for those graphs. So for this work, I've kind of said, for the actual work that we delivered to the Health Foundation, we've done that in two separate files where we've got the outputs and then we've got the underlying data that they can kind of cross reference. But in this case, I wanted to show an example of a way of doing that. So we can use this DT package. Um, so using DT here, we can create a function by where which we have to just input a, a data frame essentially, and that whether we can then specify you know, how big it is in terms of how many rows it has, how we want it to be organized, how we want the reader to be able to access that data, whether they can copy it or download it. Uh, and obviously they can also just search certain things as well. So it's kind of a useful tool again for, for readers to be able to um, investigate, I suppose, themselves. So again, where we have the we have these varying curves, we can derive the, the regional deficits for each of those. So if we wanted to do that, we wanted to plot the different deficits um, in terms of absolute counts in this case. So this is the kind of cumulative deficit for each region. Um, but again, that's in some ways a function of their pre-pandemic Rates. So if they're used to treating more people and there's a drop off to a similar amount for everybody, then the regions with the highest pre-pandemic levels are going to have the highest kind of absolute cumulative deficit. So in that case, we might want to look at how the deficits were proportionally different. So we see the Midlands and Northeast have a, the highest absolute deficit, but proportionally uh, the Northwest was most most impacted, most kind of disrupted, you might say. So in this sense, in this way, we with using the the difference in the two trends, uh, so the, the total deficit as a proportion of the the pre-pandemic total. So we might say that the northwest um, in the northwest, kind of over over half of the expected activity for hip replacements wasn't able to to be under undertaken. Same for southwest. So 
over half of their their kind of expected activity levels were was disrupted by by COVID in this case, compared to only around 30% in London. So again, just indicating the effectiveness of whatever London did differently. Um, I've just included the, the kind of GG plot code there, but that's not overly interesting. So that's the, that's the, that's the kind of focus, I suppose, is the, to look at proportional um, differences by different regions or subgroups. So in terms of deprivation again, so if we look at the proportional um, deficit for each deprivation quintile in, in elective hip care, we do see a deprivation gradient where the most deprived, um, least affluent groups are more, um, you know, significantly more impacted than the than the more affluent groups. Not hugely steep, but, but still significantly so. But again, near half the amount of activity not occurring for, for those patients. Or in that case, just over half, I think. Um, we also broke down this relationship with deprivation um, and proportional disruption by different regions. So hopefully, the the kind of the trend jumping out to you there would be would be London again. So we're seeing here we've got the um, deprivation quintiles. So again, one being the least least um, affluent, five being the most affluent. So we're seeing in London this deprivation gradient where the poorer or the the more deprived groups um, having slightly high levels of disruption or delays or, or cancellations or whatever it may have been to to disrupt care um, being more prevalent in those groups. And obviously in quite an aggressive way. That isn't uniform across the country. There are regions where that there seems to be no relationship or even inversely there seems to be um, the opposite where kind of middle to higher incomes or not necessarily incomes, but middle to higher levels of affluence are, are having kind of more disruption. I suppose one hypothesis of ours for what might be going on here was that as a function of these um, surgical hubs spread out around the, around the city um, may have been more effective in terms of delivering care, but that may have not been equally experienced for, for different levels of deprivation. It may be that by moving Someone's someone's hip replacement from their local hospital to a hospital, you know, potentially in the other side of London. Um, ge geographical kind of access became a feature that that wasn't um, equally felt across the population. Similarly, we looked at deprivation and kind of disruption in terms of ethnic ethnic subgroups. Again, seeing kind of mixed mixed relationships here. No huge difference with with white groups. Um, however, in the Asian subgroup, we're, we're again seeing a deprivation gradient. Um, again, this is just a, yeah, this is just a, a GG plot with a facet rack, a facet gradient. Um, so again, this one's more difficult to, to kind of point to any any explanatory, explanatory kind of features that we noticed, but we wanted to kind of look at drill down into this Asian subgroup a little bit further to see if anything jumps out. So repeating the same process, but only with kind of Asian patients looking at their um, kind of more granular ethnic descriptions. We, we I suppose we can say that again, Indian and Pakistani groups have a bit of a, a gradient there, whereas this message is much more, much more mixed in, in other subgroups. That's pretty much our approach there. I'll just pause for questions on the planned care before we move on to um, patterns in unplanned care and how that might compare to, to planned care. Anything popping up at all? Uh, not currently, Alex, but um, we've had some nice feedback um, that people are really enjoying the presentation and the, the style you're taking. Yeah, good. No yeah, questions. Well, yeah, by all means, feel free to jump in, but I'll just plow on. Um, so, so that was that was planned care. Um, when we came to look at unplanned admissions, uh, we essentially tried to repeat a similar a similar approach, but we wanted to then be able to compare the two. So, I think nothing overly complex here. Just the GG plot again. So this is how COVID seems to impact. Um, Emergency, emergency attendances for um, for hip replacements or hip kind of related complications. 
So again, we do see a kind of a COVID drop off, drop off, much less so, um, and you know, a relative recovery really where we're kind of near pre-pandemic levels. Um, same approach with looking at the de deficit. It wasn't necessarily um, taken as, as we didn't necessarily expect or know whether whether or not to expect a deficit or a, an excess in this situation. Um, so it was the kind of first finding really is that there was indeed a, a deficit as well. And so kind of an overall reduction in, in hip care, whether that's planned or unplanned. Um, which I suppose is interesting because you wouldn't necessarily, other than other than kind of um, reductions in people's mobility, you wouldn't necessarily expect a huge drop off in, in emergency hip care because, you know, accidents can, you would expect would continue to happen throughout lockdown, albeit people were moving less. So deficit overall, um, less so obviously within the recovery period. So as kind of mimicked by this graph, recovery does return to almost pre-pandemic levels and that's seen here as well. Cumulatively, this deficit, um, we can see here, I suppose, that changes in the deficit or at times where the deficit increases seems to be fairly closely matched to, to kind of lockdown periods. So during national lockdown, we see a, an increase in, in the deficit or you know a further reduction in people having ED attendances. Throughout recovery, we see a bit of a plateau, not enough so that the, the deficit does actually decrease. We're not seeing an excess in care and therefore a, a reduction in, in the deficit. We're just seeing a plateau, so no further reduction. And then come third lockdown, we again see an increasing in the deficit, or, or that is to say a further reduction in people accessing or demanding um, ED care. Regionally, it's a fairly similar picture for everywhere other than the southeast. So I suppose it's not to, that relationship that we see above here for the for the whole country isn't isn't the same everywhere, but mostly we're seeing increases again, plateaus and increases again. However, in this case, for example, we, we do have something different happening in the northeast where they must have been able to either have a, a backlog that they could kind of treat or they were increasing normal more than they would expect to, to be treating and then therefore their deficit reduced. But again, increased probably come the second lockdown. However, the southeast, this was just a much kind of a much a relationship with a much lower magnitude. There was much less variation going on there. Um, which we still, you know, we still need to drill down on, I think. In terms of regionally, so if we remember that London had the, the smallest um, kind of level of disruption for planned care, but seemingly had the highest level of proportional disruption in terms of ED care. So the, the kind of the questions that overshadow all of these, this part of the analysis is what would we expect to see with, with changes in planned care? So is it the case that a an increase in planned care would then proactively treat people with hip problems and then you'd expect to see less emergency care? Or is it the case that an increase in planned care just denotes increased demand across the population and therefore you would expect to see a, a kind of similar and, and proportional increase in emergency care? That's the question that we haven't really been able to answer and that there are different um, pieces of evidence that point one way or the other, but that's kind of an overriding question that I think is, is of interest and, and it's important to contextualize all of these findings really is what would we do we expect to see that do, with a with a decrease in um, decrease in emergency or, or a le less disruption in London for the planned care is that expected to be seen with a um, higher level of disruption in unplanned care or just less demand for unplanned care because they were treating more people in the elective route. Who knows, essentially. So when we try and plot those two things alongside each other, we do see London as, a, as an outlier here. So again, the question is, would we expect to see data points in the kind of bottom left and top right in that increases in one would denote increases in the other and, and kind of vice versa? Or is it the case that as you, as you saw increases in planned care, you would then expect to see decreases in unplanned, so then you expect your points to be there. 
the, the jury's, I think, still out on that one. We knew, do see London as an outlier, but it's difficult to define whether or not these are concerning or not, I suppose. If we look at deprivation in those terms, I suppose firstly we do, just to, just to clarify, in terms of proportional disruption to ED care, by deprivation we again do see a bit of a gradient, where we see the more affluent groups um, having less disruption to their the expected levels of ED attendances. Um, whether that's because they are um, kind of more able to, to demand or, or navigate the healthcare system is one kind of hypothesis, um, or, is it, or is it something to do with um, not being kind of exposed to risk factors of ED related hip issues that might be more prevalent in, in um, lower levels of affluence and, and that might have maintained throughout the pandemic. But again, we do see a bit of a gradient. However, with with this plot, when we see when we try and plot the the kind of changes in planned and unplanned alongside each other, we we do see something that would indicate obviously a trend um, that might lead us to think that we would expect data points to be along those kind of lines. Generally, we the kind of the finding is that more affluent groups are least disrupted in in both settings and least least affluent or more deprived groups are more disrupted in both care settings in terms of hip injuries and, and things that require hip replacements. Um, I'll skip past ethnicity for the moment. And I'll also, I'll also come back to quality of life because that's a bit of a final thing. There was one piece of um, analysis that was prompted after we sent this over to um, the Health Foundation. The question that they came back with that, that we think is quite interesting is okay, how would we what would, what would be the changes in the national deficit if all regions had recovered in a similar way to London? So if it is the case that London did something very different in terms of their design and also perhaps their funding, if that was applied to all regions, how much of a reduction in the deficit would we see? So we, we essentially modelled alternative admission trends for each region um, to, to match the recovery profile of London. So that is, if, if, if you can remember, fair play to you, but if you can remember, that's a, a drop down to, to near zero and then a quite, quite prolonged um, kind of lockdown period where it was near zero throughout all of lockdown and then a delayed recovery. But then when that recovery started, London then reached pre-pandemic levels. So essentially, we with our, our kind of model, we define our Y value based on where it is in the in the year. So if it's before lockdown, we'll, we'll, we'll keep it as the 2020 value. If it's during lockdown, it will be zero. If it's in the recovery, it will be a, a kind of line function of um, the point at which London began to recover and the point at which London reached its pre-pandemic levels. And then once it's at those pre-pandemic levels, it will remain similar to the average of 19, uh, 1819. So that looks a little bit like this. So again, we've got the 1819 is, is the yellow, blue 2020, and the modeled line is, is the red one. So again, we've got this should, you know, almost totally match or kind of, I suppose, quite crudely match the London recovery. And if that was experienced in, in the other regions, it would look like this. So to answer that question as to how the deficit would change if all regions had um, a similar recovery to London, we can essentially define by the area between the actual data that we saw in 2020 and the modelled data. Um, so essentially at a national level that accounts for about 20,000 admissions. So if, if we remember that the, the total admission deficit for the country was 57,000-ish, so nearly 60,000. So we can say that essentially if, if all regions had recovered like London, the deficit would have been a third less or a third of the people who had had their care delayed or cancelled may have may have been able to access care if, if this in this you know alternative situation if that had been the case which i suppose is you know fairly considerate when we fairly important when we come to look at how that affects people's quality of life again i've just added in the the regional data here so that's slightly different regionally um but overall yeah twenty thousand or so so just to finally end on uh and this and this topic is these delays that we saw in various populations can also be applied to uh, in a kind of health economic approach can be applied to qualities. 
so there's a, a piece of um, literature out there that um, I probably should have included the link to um, that quantified the effect on some on, on a, in, in qualities that somebody will experience um, with every one week delayed hip care. Um, so we were able to take that figure, I think it was something like 0.06 qualities or something. So we're able to take that, that um, estimate and apply that to all of our um, waiting times or the number of the, the number of weeks that, that the population had to wait for hip care, which gave us nearly 900 qualities in total. So that, that can also be um, quantified in monetary terms by using this kind of accepted value of £20,000 per quality with a with a kind of discount per year to to be monetized to 426 million pounds worth of, of kind of lost utility as a result of delays in, in hip care you know whether that's through people not being able to work or not being able to to be productive in, in other ways that's kind of how, where that number came from so fairly impactful um across the population um but yeah, that's just we didn't we didn't drill down any further with that in terms of how that would affect different groups. So that's kind of a, a bit of a, like a macro level. But yeah, I don't think I have any. So I suppose just to to kind of I suppose close the this was all completed kind of in R and R markdown, and the the main benefit I think of for that is is obviously this is a I think quite a novel alternative to to PowerPoint, for example, um, which also kind of you know auto updates every time you kind of run it or render it so we were able to to kind of design the analysis as we went and went along with kind of with communication from from the clients as to different directions they want us to take it and and kind of offer updates as as and when we have the data um, but it was quite a um interactive process with us and them and that allowed us to to just shift the direction of the work um based on on input and and this kind of tool i think matched that quite quite well. Um, similarly, because this is all linked to, to SUS data, um, essentially what I did was run a few SQL queries and create um, tables for that and then link the um, NCDR R Studio kind of environment to the NCDR SQL environment. So the data was stored on it on SQL and then every time I would work, would work on it, it would pull it back in. So any changes in, in that data, whether I wanted to to adjust the code or whether if it was kind of, if I was using you know very recent data as that as that data would be coming in every time I reran it, this would be updating. So you know obviously quite useful in terms of, of automation in that sense. But yeah, I think that's all I really need to say. Um, that's yeah. great. Thank you, Alex. Um, we do have um, a couple of questions that have come in. I'll just uh, read those out. So one person is asking, have you looked at the same figures by rate of population rather than numbers of admissions? Um, no, no, essentially not. So we we kind of we instead of doing that, we felt that we would hit that type of um, answer by looking at the proportional differences. So the proportional changes for those subgroups based on their their previously seen admission volumes in that sense, in that sense. Um, but no, yeah, I mean, we could have, we obviously could have looked at, at populational rates and stuff, but it was, we looked at things over the, the year as a whole, as opposed to kind of smaller rates in time or, or kind of subgroups. But no, yeah, we could have done, I think. Um, and um, another question is, um, what format was the data in when you received it? Was it a file or a database or something else? Yeah, so it's, it's, um, it's the kind of, I suppose it's the database. Um, I don't know the kind of the, the what how that actually works, but essentially, if you have access to NCDR, you have access to their their SQL data storage place, and also also their kind of R Studio, their R Studio setting, and you can kind of form remote um, connections between those two to bring in directly the data from directly from SQL to to your R Studio. So it was essentially kind of un, un untampered with. Um, so it's data, so I said, you know, all of the, the fields possible and I was able to filter down that way. But yeah, my kind of my SQL queries were fairly broad. It was just like all because um, it's now national picture as well. It was kind of all attendances for those various hit procedures in, in kind of all ages, all population groups 
just from I think 2018 onwards. So they were fairly large files, which which kind of I suppose translates to this um, R markdown being quite a when it when it runs, it's not particularly quick, but um, I kind of wanted to keep things as broad as possible to then be able to drill down into the data when it was in R. Yeah, it was um, that kind of remote connection. I think is the key. It allows you to to you're not breaking any kind of GDPR guidelines or anything there. Because it's it's all kind of within the same security. Sure. And um, did you load the data into another data store before you analysed it, such as SQL Server or Oracle? No, yeah, so I think that question essentially, that, that answer answers that question as well. It was, it was all kind of remotely accessed and it kind of stayed in the, in the NCDR um, server. And um, you, you, you've used R Markdown, um, but uh, we have a question here. Um, how does it maintain the interaction with the charts and graphs? Um, yeah, like how, how, how does that work with presenting the finding? Yeah, so the so the interactive you know, the interactive inter interactivity is only only a feature I think in when it's in HTML file. So you can obviously output it to a Word, PDF, or a HTML when you kind of knit it in in R. That you kind of you have, you have the option there. So I main I kind of I suppose I think also when you set up the R Markdown file, it prompts you to say if you you, know, you can you can choose HTML now and later specify that you want to output it into Word or PDF. Um, but I don't know if, it, if the, the inverse is the case, so I kind of maintain kept it as a HTML to have these interactive graphs because I think if I had knitted it together as a Word document, then these wouldn't be wouldn't be a feature. But um, yeah, but I think that, and also I think to be fair, this I would I would kind of um, advocate for sharing things in a HTML form anyway because they you can just attach the HTML file as a like a. Um, attachment to an email in the same way you would a Word document or a PDF and, and the kind of the, the person on the other end doesn't need to be within your kind of network or anything. They can they can go externally and they can be opened and it, this just this will just pop up. But it will be in someone's obviously someone's in someone's internet, in, internet browser. So yeah, which, which then allows you to have the interactive graphs. That's great and um, for anyone uh, watching today who's interested in learning a bit more about our markdown, we have um, offered some uh, previous webinars and part of our conference workshops we've been looking at that so um, you know, feel free to drop us a line and we can direct you to some more information there um, and Alex another question we have is um, some areas of the country never really left lockdown um, Leicester being one example which would have impacted their ability to recover rates how did you account for this regional variation when you compared recovery rates uh we didn't account for it we were aware of it so that was one of the most complex things to try and to try and get our, get our, our kind of a hand on really was was exactly yeah that the the kind of pandemic hit different air different areas of the country differently which is kind of why all of my timelines are are actually kind of policy driven as opposed to like they're derived from national lockdowns and stuff as opposed to to waves and, and kind of regional spikes because the the variation across the country as as Person asking the question says was was fairly huge. So I don't know how I could have done that, and I, I would very much welcome feedback as to how that would have been possible. Really, other than you know, inputting. The, I suppose this project wasn't really of that scale where we didn't really have the capacity within this project to to also collate various um, kind of case numbers and stuff to to then derive our own kind of regional trends. Um, it was I just felt like a little bit of a rabbit hole, and it was it was something that we kind of were aware of being, you know, potentially an issue um, in terms of the results, but didn't really have the capacity or even really the know-how personally to to account for that. So yeah, all I can say is that it was, we knew it was there, but we didn't know what to do with it. And uh, one last question which has come through is, um, will people be able to access the code you use to um, produce this that shared? Uh, Yes, when I figure out how to use GitHub. So I was um, I was watching the previous month's webinar just yesterday as trying to figure out how to put things on GitHub and stuff. So once I've, I've done that, I will send you guys a link and then you guys can kind of forward that I suppose, to the network. Yeah, perfect. That's great. I'm sure um, if I was having, we can 
share all of that to our Slack channel too. Um, and that is all our questions for today. So um, is there anything else you'd like to um, share with us, Alex? No, no, I think that's, that it feels very exposing to show people code and stuff. It looks like, yeah, it feels like you're inside my brain. So you've seen enough. <laughs> Well, thank you very much for attending everyone. And um, as we said before, Alex, we've had some really nice comments and feedback there um, about the approach you took in sharing your work with us. Um, as I said before, uh, this will be made available as we have um, uh, today's session. Just to also make you aware the next webinar will be happening on 18th of August at 1 p.m. and that's presented by Dr. Anna Heath from uh, Toronto Sick Kids. And if anyone hasn't heard, we have announced the dates for the 2021 NHSR Community Conference, which will be happening um, the beginning of November. More details to come very soon, including how you can register for that. But we're really excited for all the speakers that we'll be having. So thanks again for attending. We hope you enjoyed um, today's session and thank you to Alex for um, a great presentation. See you next month. Thank you.